these are some of the most infamous men of the Nazi regime. The Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler. Hitler was utterly ruthless. Anything that stood in his way, he could justify to himself that it was worth getting rid of. The fighter ace, Hermann Goering. A bon vivant. He liked women, he liked wine, he liked drugs. The spin doctor, Joseph Goebbels. The ultimate sycophant. He just tells Hitler always what he wants to hear and makes Hitler feel great about himself. Head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler. He enjoyed the trappings of power. He enjoyed his relationship with Hitler, and he would do whatever it took to ensure that that continued. The gatekeeper, Martin Bormann. He was a ruthless man. He had blood on his hands. He was the sort of man that Hitler needed to do his dirty work. Each name conjures its own special nightmare. But could they work together to bring the grand Nazi vision to fruition? Or would their toxic and dangerous self-interest cause dysfunction and ruin? The Nazi leadership was ambitious, it was ruthless, it was cutthroat, it was absolutely backstabbing, and you couldn't trust anyone so much as look at them. What is the pathway to promotion? How do you assume a leadership role in the Third Reich? It's by telling Hitler to no small extent what he wants to hear. Without question, it is inherently dysfunctional. Hitler's leadership was often contradictory and self-serving intentionally handing out confusing and overlapping duties to his underlings, keeping them busy fighting among themselves rather than plotting against him was part of his ploy. Well, Hitler's management style was notoriously shambolic. I mean, here was a guy who went to bed early or else stayed up all night watching movies, invariably slept past noon, had a notoriously short intention span, didn't listen to briefings, didn't read stuff, always operated on his gut, and uh, thought his gut was superior to the professional views of others who were really reading intelligence reports and doing real analysis of problems. So it tended to be he would try to reinforce his prejudices. If he wanted to do something, he would find reasons to do it or find people who would tell him it was doable, and he would ignore or purge critics. And the toxic attitude poisoned any chance of a proper functioning elite. Stay on the good side of Hitler or else was an excellent policy. Failure meant a swift fall from favor. And in Nazi Germany, this could be very bad for your health. One of the tactics that Hitler uses, is not only in Germany, but within his own government, is dividing and ruling. Setting one sector of society up against another, one department up against another, one individual up against another, always making sure that neither faction really knew where they stood. If individuals are jostling for position, they are perhaps not creating any opposition to Hitler. But the upsides were very alluring. To make it into his inner circle, brought with it security, immense power, and often wealth. To get there was not so much a matter of abilities, more a need to demonstrate slavish devotion and a ruthless drive to make it through the ranks. One man who excelled in the traits that went to making a successful Nazi was Hermann Goering. Goering was a, a bon vivant, you know. He, he liked women, he liked wine, he liked drugs, he liked uh, partying, he liked ceremony, he liked decorative uniforms, uh, and he loved 
art, and real estate. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. Goering was flamboyant, vain, and downright weird. He built a palace in a hunting reserve, dressed in period clothes, and tried to have extinct animals re-engineered back to life so he could hunt them like in the good old days of German mythology. Being hopelessly hooked on morphine, which he originally started taking for injuries suffered in the Beer Hall Putsch of 1923, may explain some of this behavior. Goering had the talent to rub people up the wrong way throughout his life. He was arrogant, he was vain, he was bombastic. And if you didn't know him too personally, people were often sort of drawn into his personality and they found him charming. But once you actually realized that you had to work with him, you knew you were dealing with, you know, a morphine addict who was inconsistent, who had mood swings. Goering was deserving of his top spot, but equally, he condemned himself to his fall from grace. Despite often looking like one, Goering was no clown. When he put his mind to it, he was as efficiently evil as the next Nazi. And he caught Hitler's eye. Goering had been a commander of the Flying Circus Squadron in World War I, under the famous Baron von Richthofen, the Red Baron, and had proved his skill with 22 kills to his name. Goering had all the star power and the swagger of being a fighter ace in the First World War. Hitler really latched onto that. He needed that sort of sense of gravitas and almost flamboyance to make the National Socialist movement stand out. It was a wedding of convenience for the two. You know, Hitler had the star power and Goering had this sort of sense of needing to restore Germany to its greatness, particularly as he had seen the German Air Force be utterly smashed to pieces and demoralized after the First World War, and he had sworn to restore German aviation to the skies. So Hitler was the man to do it with him. Goering rose quickly through the ranks. In 1923, Hitler placed him in charge of the Sturmabteilung, or SA which Goering quickly shaped into a large and powerful organization of agitators and thugs. Operating way outside the law, they were essentially Hitler's bully boys, targeting any opposition to the Nazi agenda. Goering's arrogance made him hugely unpopular with the men under his command. But it emboldened the burgeoning Nazi party to attempt to seize power by force. By 1923, the party had grown confident enough to attempt a brazen coup. The National Socialists made a stand under Hitler at a beer hall in Munich with a plan to overthrow the federal government. But the plan failed. 16 party members were killed, and Goering was badly wounded. Goering suffered with that wound for the rest of his life. It created this morphine addiction that made him balloon in weight, and ultimately, it did change his personality. You know, even though he had been seen as a bit of a, a difficult man and an arrogant man, he was a smart man. And the morphine sort of blunted that intelligence. The plot may have failed catastrophically, but for one old friend of Hitler's, it had its advantages. Ernst Rom, who had been front and center during the failed putsch, displaced the incapacitated Goering as head of the SA. Under his command, 
Rom saw the numbers swell to almost three million strong. But trouble was brewing. The signature backstabbing and double-crossing that was to define the Nazi inner circle was about to show its ugly face. In July 1932, the Nazis won the election, due in no small way to the intimidation by the SA. Hitler was now chancellor, and Goering was named as president of the Reichstag and his right-hand man. All seemed to be going well for the Nazis, but the factions and power centers within were beginning to attack each other. An early trigger for the internal wars was the rise of the SA. Many worried it had become too big, and the leader, Ernst Röhm, was publicly moving away from Hitler's ideology. Hitler was always concerned that there might be factions within the Nazi party that could challenge his own leadership. And we see him really trying to consolidate his power base and removing those enemies that could potentially pose a challenge uh, to his leadership and his supremacy. Rom and the SA were a powerful potential force that he would find very difficult to control. To keep the SA in check, Hitler created the SS Security Service and then expanded the Gestapo, the infamous secret state police, placing them both under Heinrich Himmler. This new version of organized thuggery could now counteract the power of the SA and their leader, Ernst Röhm. Nazi leaders Hermann Göring, Deputy Nazi Chief Rudolf Hess, Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels, and SS leader Heinrich Himmler began to coalesce around a deadly plan to rid themselves of Ernst Röhm for good. In 1934, the Cabal began their campaign against Röhm. They planted rumors and fake evidence that Rome was planning an overthrow of the regime. Swirling talk of homosexuality was also given plenty of air. Neither Rome nor the SA ever planned to seize power in Germany. But the truth never got in the way of a good Nazi conspiracy. Despite Rome being one of his oldest friends, Hitler seized the opportunity and charged Himmler and the SS with carrying out a massive and deadly purge of the SA officials, including Röhm. It was to be swift and merciless. It would become known as the Night of the Long Knives. Hitler was utterly ruthless. Anything that stood in his way, he could justify to himself that it was worth getting rid of. So if Rahm and the SA had to be exterminated, then why not do it? On June the 28th, 1934, the knives were sharpened for a bloody and brutal evening as the regime prepared to turn viciously on itself. Hitler ordered Rahm and the SA leaders to gather at a Bavarian spa where SS units surprised, disarmed, and arrested them. After being taken to prison, most were shot on the spot without trial. SA supporters took to the streets in protest, while an enraged Hitler ordered a swathe of mass arrests and killings. Thousands were arrested. The next day, on orders from Hitler, Rom was shot in his cell. His last words were, Heil Hitler. After the Night of the Long Knives and the death of Rom, we see Hitler make a very bold statement that he was no longer willing to put up with those that threatened his power base. He became a dictator, he became a tyrant, because, of course, he had to stamp on that opposition that might otherwise oust him from power. The Nazis had shown 
They were prepared to murder their own to achieve their goals. From now on, nothing was out of bounds. Nothing too extreme. Lawlessness and brutality was now a weapon of the regime. Fear had taken root in his circle of leaders. No one ever felt safe again. This was a ruthlessness that he not only exposed the party to, but also the nation to. The idea that there was only one leader for Germany. He was building himself an edifice from which he couldn't be toppled. Hitler's next target was the army. Two top commanders who felt the cold grip of Nazi infighting were War Minister Werner von Blomberg and Fritsch, the head of the Wehrmacht. Uh, Hitler had sat down in 1937 with his military leaders, chief among them Bloomberg, the Minister of War, and Fritsch, the Commander-in-Chief of the Wehrmacht, and he had kind of outlined his aggressive plans for German expansion, uh, principally in Eastern Europe, then even the Soviet Union. These guys were really alarmed, and they began to push back inside the German military, saying, you know, Hitler might be off his rocker, you know? I mean, these, these are pretty ambitious plans, and Hitler gets wind of these rumblings inside the German army, and he decides, I gotta get rid of these guys. I need to put in place men who will be loyal to me and will carry out my orders without hesitation. And so he kind of trumps up a couple of scandals. The first scandal involved von Blumberg. In January 1938, he married 26-year-old typist Erna Grun, with Hermann Goering as best man and Hitler himself as the witness. But the course of true love never did run smooth, particularly in Nazi Germany. Some pornographic images of Bloomberg's new wife surfaced, together with evidence that she had once been a prostitute. Bloomberg's days as Minister of War were numbered, and Hitler had the perfect replacement, a man with craven ambition who could be relied upon to do his bidding. Hermann Goering. It is very clear that Hitler wanted to ensure that he placed at the head of the military individuals that he could manipulate. Hitler ordered Blumberg to annul the marriage in order to avoid scandal and preserve the integrity of the army. When he refused, Goering threatened to publicly expose Blumberg's wife's sordid past. Finally, Blumberg gave up and resigned all posts. Flush with their success at destroying Blumberg, Hitler and Goering now turned their attention to Commander-in-Chief of the Wehrmacht, Werner von Fritsch. The next to fall is Fritsch, you know, the Commander-in-Chief of the Wehrmacht. Uh, then Hitler concocts this wholly outrageous story that that Fritsch is a closeted homosexual and he's bringing dishonor on the Prussian and German officer corps. And so Fritsch, who you know, demands a military court of honor, says this is not true, is forced in turn to resign his post. And Hitler then moves in as commander in chief of the Wehrmacht. With both Blumberg and Fritsch gone, Goering was able to cement his position as the man who could get things done for Hitler. His star was on the rise, with his Luftwaffe dominating in the blitzkrieg attacks on Poland and France. Goering was rewarded by Hitler and appointed his successor as Führer of all Germany. Goering was now the highest ranking soldier in Germany, answering only to Hitler, which of course made the rest of the Nazi party leadership insanely jealous. Early on in the war, the successes in Poland and in, in the French campaign, this gives uh, Goering a kind of elite status among the inner circle. Hitler is purposefully manipulating his inner circle. And as loyal as these men are, and they are not just loyal, they are real sycophants. I mean, it is adulation to Hitler, partly because they understand that the more Hitler gives them, the greater their prestige. So they're always seeking Hitler's favor. And this is the reason why 
Göring lasts so long within the Nazi regime. It's for what he provided within that inner sanctum, what he provided Hitler with in terms of confidence and advice. It was his trust, it was his loyalty, and that is what Hitler demanded, perhaps above all else. It would prove a precarious position, with Göring having to constantly look over his shoulder for the knives of his rivals. They would not hesitate to bring him down at the first sign of weakness. Increasingly throughout the war, Hitler was concerned at Göring's military capability, which meant that there was a significant question mark surrounding Göring as the war progressed. That started during Dunkirk, when the evacuation took place despite the attentions of the Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe couldn't produce the sort of strategic victories that Goering suggested that it could. As the war goes on and his star begins to decline, partly because of his obvious failures, Goering defaults back into his morphine addiction becomes ever more problematic and he kind of falls away from the scene. But if Goering was Hitler's closest confidant in the military leadership, his most trusted party man was undoubtedly Minister for Propaganda and Enlightenment, Joseph Goebbels. Adolf Hitler's fanatic little propaganda minister, Paul Joseph Goebbels. The most Nazi of all the Nazis. He was fanatical, loyal to his Fuhrer, and power mad. Goebbels had immense power because Hitler's image depended upon Goebbels' manipulation of information and the development of Hitler as an heroic figure. All of the leading Nazis, whether we're talking about you know, Goebbels, Bormann, Himmler, Goering, they all figure out early on that Hitler's a weak man and that Hitler's easily manipulated. Goebbels, because he's a the ultimate sycophant he just tells Hitler always what he wants to hear and makes Hitler feel great about himself. And he's always at Hitler's side and he's always spouting Nazi propaganda. He's a key player. Propaganda Minister Goebbels told them Germany didn't want a war at all. Goebbels had proved his mastery of the media and Nazi marketing as he rose through the ranks of the Nazi party. He adapted recent developments in advertising with use of catchy slogans eye-catching posters and cryptic headlines to further the Nazi party cause and image. He penetrated the very fabric of German society, taking the voice of the Nazis directly into lounge rooms by making radios cheap and readily available. They were even handed out free on his birthday. Like Hitler, he practiced his speeches in front of the mirror perfecting his body language to convey power with highly choreographed hand gestures and vocal inflections. He always knew how to make an entrance to give the most emotional impact. He used the old trick of keeping the audience waiting, then hitting them with everything. With his striking eyes and attractive voice, Goebbels, was the undisputed Nazi pin-up boy and a prolific womanizer, despite a club foot, which had prevented him from enlisting as a fighting soldier. With the outbreak of war, Goebbels began using his propaganda machine to shape messages and control information about what was happening on the fighting fronts. His word spread as gospel throughout Germany. In 1943, Goebbels was appointed Minister for Total War. After pressuring Hitler to adopt the policy, which included measures like closing non-essential businesses, conscripting women into the labor force, and enlisting more men into the Wehrmacht, 
The whole idea of a, of a total war idea, it's a wonderful propaganda message. It shows the uh, ability of Goebbels to seize a moment to say it is now very clear that the war is being lost, that we've suffered a great setback, and we need to respond to this. We need to respond to this by seizing the moment and allowing people to believe, oh, we do have excess capacity. Oh, the war is now seriously going to be fought by Germany. Now we're going to take the other hand out from behind our back and fight this war. As with every new maneuver and promotion within the Nazi hierarchy, someone was going to end up feeling overlooked and threatened. This time, it was Goering. Goebbels was pushing for changes in armaments production and industry, which put him directly in conflict with Goering. After his failures at the Battle of Britain, and inability to reduce losses on the Eastern Front, his precious Luftwaffe was about to be given a vote of no confidence as armaments for his aircraft were reduced. Goering was starting to feel disrespected and marginalized. When total war becomes a reality in 1944, led by Goebbels, we see that Goering is beside himself with rage, that he isn't giving the responsibility that he had expected, that he had demanded, that he had put a great deal of thought into, and felt that those that were responsible for it didn't have the experience to produce a total war economy. And he was probably right. Central to the Nazi vision of a total war economy was a fearful, and utterly subservient population, together with hundreds of thousands of slave laborers. This would be the job of the feared Reichstate Security Police Force, the SS, led by another of Hitler's trusted inner circle, Heinrich Himmler. Himmler was one of Hitler's most trusted allies. He was given probably more ability to go his own way than other peers. Being in control of the national administration was a huge responsibility and provided him with a huge power base. Also having responsibility for the SS, if you like, the, the party's own political military force. Himmler's SS death squads were to become universally feared throughout Europe and were responsible for the deaths of millions of Poles and Slavs in the East. Nazi commanders were well advised to keep on the right side of Himmler. Falling out with him, as some commanders did, meant a swift removal from power, or worse. His power derived from the trust of the Fuhrer he was very loyal to Hitler, and Hitler was very loyal to him. There's no doubt that the nature of his responsibility for internal security meant that he could use that power base to turn upon his enemies very, very quickly, and very quickly remove them, and he did that on, on many occasions. And so there's no doubt that the inner sanctum around Hitler were wary of Himmler because he himself was incredibly ruthless. He was given free reign to carry out his diabolical mission, orchestrating and administrating the extermination of the Jews and anyone who was not of so-called pure Aryan blood. Himmler was responsible for the creation and management of the death camps during World War II at the behest of his political mentor and sponsor, Adolf Hitler. Himmler begins, you know, studying the, the progress of the Aryan race and its contrast with other races, impelled in part by Hitler because of his own sort of ambiguous past, but also by Himmler, who begins to, you know, cumber Nazi Germany with a particular evil that f finds its fullest expression in the Holocaust, the final solution. Himmler it seems was untouchable in the Fuhrer's eyes. Even after the attempted assassination of Hitler by senior army commanders in 1944, the infamous von Stauffenberg plot, 
he went unpunished for his failure to detect and defuse the plot in advance. It was a massive embarrassment for Himmler. To soothe his shame, he promptly rounded up and executed thousands of suspects as his way of demonstrating his loyalty to Hitler and restoring the reputation of the SS. Though he was in thrall of his Führer, Himmler, like other ambitious Nazi officials, had aspirations to succeed Hitler as Germany's leader. One man he suspected of standing in his way was Albert Speer, the original architect of the great Berlin buildings and monuments to the glory of the Reich. Speer so impressed Hitler with his architectural visions of a new Berlin that he appointed him to the critical post of Minister for Armaments and Munitions. Now, some people say he was a part of the inner circle, but he was an architect who Hitler enjoyed having conversations about new design. He wasn't a power broker, but therein lies the decision. He's a new player. Hitler doesn't allow any one man to assume too much power, and he is absolutely loyal to Hitler. Therefore, he becomes the perfect person in this system to assume that position. We see a tremendous dysfunction in Hitler's inner circle because the people who are running things are not necessarily appointed because of their competence. Speer appealed to Hitler's vanity that Hitler thought he and Speer were fellow architects and artists and creative geniuses. And uh, so he, he loved spending time with Speer and looking over plans for a new Reich Chancery or the, a new imperial capital of Berlin. Hitler was so admiring of Speer that Himmler considered him an especially dangerous rival, both in the administration of the Reich and as a potential successor to Hitler. As a means of getting Speer on side, Himmler offered him the prestigious rank of SS Oberst Gruppenführer, but Speer was having none of it. The last thing he needed was to be under Himmler's watchful eye. He knew it would be hard to say no when Himmler wanted to say in armaments production. He begins to rework the German armaments industry. He's now competing for resources, and the underlings of the Third Reich are all seeking to both protect their own empires and make Speer look bad. Speer then looks to Goebbels. Goebbels has got his own competition with, with Himmler, and they become natural allies. But that means that the central focus of the inner circle are not necessarily focused on the best outcome for the war, but on protecting private interests. After the war, Speer was spared execution and spent 20 years in prison during which time he wrote accounts of his experience in Hitler's inner circle. According to Speer, the powerful men under Hitler, including Joseph Goebbels, Hermann Goering, and Heinrich Himmler, were from early on jostling for favor and watching each other like a pack of childish pretenders to the throne. But perhaps the greatest threat to all of them was Hitler's personal secretary, Martin Bormann. From the start, he made himself seem insignificant while imperceptibly building his influence until he was arguably the second most powerful man of the Nazi Reich, referred to by some as the secret leader. I see Bormann as the doorman that would only allow entry into the inner sanctum of the Nazi party if you could add value, if you were loyal, if you were to be trusted. He was a ruthless man. He had blood on his hands. He was the sort of man that Hitler needed to do his dirty work. And as a result of that, he was a trusted confidant. The first sign of Bormann's ruthlessness and brutality came immediately after World War I, when he worked closely with the nationalistic paramilitary group, the Freikorps, whose tactics could get very nasty indeed. Boermann 
enjoyed getting involved in the more robust activities of the Fry Corps. In 1928, he joined the National Socialists and was welcomed into the SS by Himmler himself. Bormann creatively managed Hitler's finances with various schemes, such as extracting royalties from Hitler's book and his image on postage stamps, as well as setting up the impressive sounding, but actually very shady, Adolf Hitler Endowment Fund of German industry, which was really a thinly veiled extortion operation on behalf of Hitler to collect more money from German industrialists. No wonder Hitler loved him. He took charge of all Hitler's paperwork, appointments, and personal finances. By now, Hitler's trust in Bormann and his worldview was so overwhelming, in one meeting, he is said to have yelled, to win this war, I need Bormann. Bormann was now the final word before Hitler in pretty much everything to do with keeping the country running. If you wanted to get to Hitler, you had to get through Bormann first. Bormann is the head of the Reich Chancellery, and essentially what that gives him is the ability to control access to Hitler. He also is a repository of a lot of knowledge. The various state leaders around Germany, they talk to him, and this gives him an indirect power with Hitler. He selectively can take a lot of information that is coming across his desk and use it to manipulate the message to Hitler. And this is a real problem for any of the other uh, rivals. Very few of them have, in that sense, a direct access to Hitler. So Bormann becomes very much a gatekeeper. And he proved to be a master of intricate political maneuvering. He was able to effectively nullify any power plays by the big names. He ruthlessly and skillfully sabotaged the agendas of all of them when he sensed any kind of threat to his power. The inner sanctum themselves are always fighting for time with Hitler. Martin Bormann seemed to be able to get Hitler on his own talk into his ear and influence him perhaps more than any other member of the close team that developed around Hitler. And as a result of that, he was seen as someone who was dangerous. In February 1943, the German defeat at Stalingrad triggered a crisis in the regime. True to form, Bormann exploited the military disaster with his moves sparking a massive power struggle within the inner circle. Bormann had a proposal to which Hitler agreed, the creation of a three-man committee with representatives from the state, the army, and the party, which would harness the country's productivity for the benefit of the war effort. The committee of three was an attempt by the Germans in the middle of World War II to really make more efficient the German use of resources and production for this multi-front war effort. And the idea was you'd have a representative of industry, a representative of the Nazi party, and a representative of the German military who would all sit around a table and decide what plans had to get funded and where resources would go. The committee of three members were Hans Lammers, influential chief of the Reich Chancellery, who worked alongside Bormann, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel from the armed forces, and, of course, Martin Bormann. Hitler seemed to like the idea of the committee, as none of the members posed any threat to his leadership, nor would they disagree with him. The committee was to propose the best independent course of action, regardless of the views of the respective ministries, with Hitler to make the final decisions, which did not suit some people at all. The Committee of Three were immediately brought under attack by sort of the Nazi hierarchy. People like Goering, people like Himmler, people like Goebbels, people like Speer, who all resented their intruding onto their little turfs. And so the Committee of Three, which was meant to rationalize the German response to World War II, ended up being a complete fizzle. Despite the Committee of Three, administrative chaos continued to dog the German war effort. Ultimate responsibility for this dysfunctionality 
lay with Hitler and his control freakish behavior, as Goebbels well knew, referring to it in his diary as a crisis of leadership. But Goebbels was too much under Hitler's spell ever to challenge his power. As the war turned steadily against Germany, as desperation and doubt seeped into the atmosphere, those in the inner circle began to viciously turn on each other. Blame went in circles, and the air around Hitler's table became more toxic and unproductive than ever. And the mighty would begin their inevitable falls from grace. Goering is increasingly marginalized by Himmler because he sees all of Goering's vulnerabilities, lack of a work ethic, his buffoonish behavior, his drug addiction, and he basically increasingly sidelines Goering in Hitler's eyes by the end of the war. There's no question that the, the inner circle becomes almost unworkable. And I think it's illustrative of the dysfunction in the inner circle that someone who has suffered as many defeats uh, both on the battlefield and personally as Goering, that he stays in that role, that he's never replaced. And, and that's just, well, it's absurd. Even though he was marginalized in the final months of the war, Goering would have one last shot at the top. When it was reported to Goering that Hitler had essentially lost his mind and was planning suicide, he decided to try to assert his claim to the leadership based on the agreement Hitler had signed, naming him as his successor. Goering sent a very carefully worded telegram requesting to take command of the Reich forces as per the agreement, but it was intercepted by Bormann who took full advantage of Hitler's paranoia to brand Goering a traitor. Hitler replied to Goering with much help from Bormann, threatening him with treason and execution unless he resigned all posts. Well, at the end of the war, you know, Goering always thought he had been anointed by Hitler as, you know, deputy Fuhrer, you know, so he thought that he had the chops to take over the job and he made the mistake of, you know, volunteering to take over because I know you're in Berlin, I know you're in the bunker, Fuhrer, and oh, that really angered Hitler. Hitler, that was the final straw for Hitler. He'd already been souring on Goering, and then when Goering's tried to sort of move and take over the, uh, the Fuhrer's office while Hitler was, you know, hunkering in the bunker waiting to blow his brains out, he said no, and Hitler takes the job away from Goering and gives it to Dönitz in, in a fit of spite. Goering resigned and started heading westwards with his family to surrender to the Americans, which was a good move. Bormann had ordered his execution anyway, if Berlin fell. Next, to make a rash grab for power, was Heinrich Himmler. Himmler was second only to Goebbels in loyalty to the Fuhrer, but he threw what remained away when in May 1945, he attempted to broker a peace deal with the Allies behind Hitler's back. Well, you begin to see just how many cracks there are only at the very end, when it's become clear that in spite of all the promises, even among the men who were supposedly the most loyal, Goering and Himmler, that they would seek to open negotiations with the Allies once it becomes clear that there's going to be a post-Hitler Germany. For Hitler, it is the final betrayal. And I guess in some ways it also shows how these men, at the end of the day, they're ultimately self-interested. The Allies refused his generous terms, and for Himmler, the game was up. As a final insult to the Holocaust mastermind, Heinrich Himmler was officially branded a traitor and, along with Goering, stripped of all Nazi rank and power. Not that it mattered. Germany was moments away from losing the war, and Himmler was days away from committing suicide after being captured by the Allies. Only Goebbels, remained steadfast in his loyalty. And with the suicide of Hitler and the fall of Germany imminent, he became chancellor. He served less than a day before he and his wife poisoned their six children and themselves. Martin Bormann had proven ruthless and conniving right to the end. And having had the satisfaction of defrocking his great nemesis Goering, 
tried to make a run for it. Although mystery long remained over his whereabouts, he was later confirmed killed by Soviet artillery as he made his last desperate bid for freedom. The walls were literally coming down around them, and they were still exacting revenge and intent on settling scores with one another until the bitter end. Right from the beginning, the seeds were sown for the destruction of the Reich from within. Self-glorification and personal power for these craven sociopaths had proved more important than actually winning the war.